Good morning. Please turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Be looking at verses 31 through 39, talking about enduring love. Enduring love. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who could be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also make intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us pray. Father in heaven, during this time, I pray that you give clarity and understanding Open our hearts and our ears to hear and to receive and apply your word. That Jesus Christ be glorified and honored. Bless the preaching of this word, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We're in the fourth week of Advent. And this week, we are speaking about love. We have been discussing hope, peace, joy as those gifts that God gives unto his people. Today, we're discussing the gift of God's love. Advent is the time of year when we focus our attention on the first advent of Christ as we look forward to his return in the clouds of glory. Today, we look at this love of God, this supernatural love that's given to those who place their trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior. And our prayer, sincerely our prayer at this time, is that we all find ourselves living in the power of the love of God. From 1 John 4.10, herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That's love. That word propitiation translates the Greek word halosmos, It means to appease or to satisfy. And in context, it's talking about to appease or satisfy the righteous demands of God's holiness for the punishment of sin. It's interesting to see this same word is used in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 5, where it's translated as the mercy seat. In Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 15 in the Old Testament, 
the mercy seat is the place where the high priest would take the blood of the animal of sacrifice and sprinkle it on the mercy seat once a year in the day of atonement. Jesus Christ is our mercy seat. He satisfied God's righteous demands against sin. From 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Again, Christ is our mercy seat. He shed his blood on our behalf. He's the one that satisfied the righteous demands of God upon sin. He took our punishment. Please turn with me to Romans chapter 5 for a moment. We're going to see the elements of hope, peace, joy, and love given in this chapter. I want to look first of all at verses 1 through 5. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory. That word means rejoice. But we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation works patience, and patience proven character and proven character, hope. And hope makes not ashamed. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Tells us something very important. The tribulations of life teach us to be patient. Patience leads to proven character. Proven character brings hope, and it's the hope that doesn't disappoint because it's hope in God. What we see from this passage, in verse 1, we have peace with God through the sacrifice of Christ. In verse 2, we rejoice We have joy in the hope of God's glory. Verse 3, we rejoice. We have joy in suffering. I know that's an unpopular message, that there's joy in suffering, but for the Christian it is so. Because suffering is what draws us closer to God. Verse 4, being patient produces proven character. Proven character produces hope. The supernatural hope that doesn't disappoint. Because God's love had been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. The love of God is further seen in verses 6 through 8. For when we were yet without strength... That means literally when we were helpless. When we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, nor peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But Christ commended his love toward us. That means he demonstrated his love toward us in that While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Tells us we were helpless. We were without strength. Christ died for the ungodly while we were yet sinners. 
and we could say it would be somewhat conceivable to us, perhaps, if someone might be willing to die for a righteous person or a good person, but Jesus shed his blood for those who were enemies of God, underscoring the love of God. Romans chapter 5, verse 9 and 10, the next couple of verses. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Brethren, before we were saved, we were enemies of God. We were enemies of God. We've been reconciled to God by the sacrifice of his son for those who have received him as Lord and Savior. We'll be saved by his life because he lives. He gave his life, but he didn't stay in that tomb. Jesus is the only propitiation for sin. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. It was required by God that that sacrifice for sin would be spotless, sinless, blameless. With that in mind, 1 Peter 1, verse 18 and 19, you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. In John chapter 1, verse 29 and 36, Jesus is said to be the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. In Hebrews 4, 15, he was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. When Jesus cried from the cross in John 19, 30, it is finished. He uttered the words to telestai. That means paid in full. This word to telestai was what was written across the bill that somebody paid and they owed nothing else. Jesus said it is finished. Paid in full. Because Christ, he satisfied God's wrath by bearing our sins. To properly understand the depths of God's love is to know that we were formerly sinners. We were formerly enemies of God. By the way, I want to say anybody who's born again is a sinner saved by grace. I don't want to cause any confusion here. Anybody that's born again is a sinner saved by grace. But you know what? If you're saved, you're no longer an enemy of God. We were dead in trespasses and sins. It means we were spiritually dead, but now we've been made alive in Christ. We were formerly blind to the gospel, but now we see clearly the truth of God's word. We were formerly slaves to sin. Now we're slaves of Christ. We were formerly in love with the darkness of sin, but now we're in love with the pursuit of righteousness. We were spiritually sick, but God has made us whole. We were formerly lost, now we're found. We were formerly aliens, strangers, and foreigners to God. But now we're fellow citizens with the saints in the household of God. 
We were formerly the children of wrath, but now we're the friends of God, joint heirs of God, joint heirs of Christ. In time past, we walked according to the course of this world under the sway of the wicked one. We walked according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. But now, because of God's love, we are a new creation. I want us all to grasp the depth of the love of God because the depth of the love of God is seen in our text for today in Romans chapter 8 verse 31 through 39 and I have to set the context first or else there's a lot of things we're going to be talking about that won't be understood to understand properly what's being said in verses 31 through 39 of Romans chapter 8, we have to go back to verse 28, verse 29, and verse 30. Here's the context. Romans 8, 28, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestine to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestine, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Tells us here that those who are born again are predestined by God to be conformed to the image of Christ. You know, when God predestines something, he makes sure it happens. Those who are born again are predestined by God to be conformed to the image of Christ. They're called, justified, and God guarantees that they will be glorified. I want you to notice in the reading of these verses that these things are said to be past tense, as though they're as good as done. That's why they're written that way. They're as good as done. Believers are called, justified, and God guarantees they'll be glorified. When we get born again, when we come into being reconciled with God, right there begins a process of sanctification. When we start learning more about God, we draw closer to Him. We learn to trust Him more and more. The process of sanctification. But glorification is the final step in being sanctified. That's when we're with Jesus. That's when we've received our glorified bodies. That's the context we're looking at. Believers are guaranteed by God that they will be conformed to the image of Christ. With that thought in mind, verse 31, Paul asks a question. What shall we say then to these things? It's a good question. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? That's the answer. God prepares his people for eternity. And he's guaranteed their passage to heaven. So if God is for us, who can be against us? And again, the content comes from that which precedes. All believers will be conformed to the image of Christ. 
They have been called, they have been justified, and they will be glorified. And notice Paul uses past tense, as good as done. We have to recognize something that's very important, I know is often difficult for people to get their hands around. Us, let me put this a different way, you and God are a majority. Me and God are a majority, are a majority because of God being the majority. Having God on our side is the majority. I want to consider a moment for what he's done for his people. When we ask the question, who can be against us? Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. God has made his people partakers of his divine nature. The Holy Spirit lives within every born-again believer. He's given great and precious promises. And along with those great and precious promises, he's given everything needed for life and godliness, which I might add also includes God's discipline for when we get out of the way, for when we start walking contrary to him. God disciplines his children. You can look that up in Hebrews 12, verse 6 through 8. So we're partakers of his divine nature because the Holy Spirit dwells within every born-again believer. And God has given everything necessary for life and godliness. Hebrews 13, 5, he will never leave us nor forsake us. Isaiah 54, verse 17, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. Every tongue that shall rise against thee in the judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And I have to say, again, our strength in God becomes more and more as our faith is increased. Our faith is strengthened when we go through the trials and tribulations of life. First Peter chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. The genuineness of our faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, that it may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We go through... Trials of faith, do we not? And rather than driving us away from God's love, these things draw us closer to God through faith. It is God who has given us faith. He's given us repentance. He's given us salvation. And our security is in God. God has called every believer. From John chapter 10, verse 27 through 29. The words of Christ. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them. And they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And it is God who guarantees the believer's salvation. That's what we're going to get into when we go further into this text. It's God 
that's guaranteed the believer's salvation. Ephesians 1, verse 13 and 14. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. That redemption of the purchased possession is when we are glorified. Ephesians 4.30, we're sealed unto the day of redemption. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 21 and 22, God has sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. 2 Corinthians 5.5, 5, God has given us the earnest of the Spirit. As we look at verse 32 of Romans chapter 8, I want us to see that God's love is seen in the fact that he gave his only begotten son. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? I have to clarify something here to make sure nobody gets off on the wrong path. In context, this promise applies to those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose, verse 28, those who were foreknown, foreordained, verse 29, those who are called, justified, and destined to be glorified, verse 30, they are known as the elect, verse 33, those for whom Christ makes intercession, that's a big one, verse 34, and those who are more than conquerors, verse 37. The love of God is seen most clearly in that God spared not his own son, Jesus pleased his Father in all things that he did. He was pleasing to God his Father. Yet Isaiah 53, 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus took the punishment that we deserved. From Isaiah 52, 13 and 14, we see that he was beaten beyond human recognition. Galatians 3, 13, that he has redeemed us from the curse of the law. And especially John 3, verse 16 through 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Therefore, he who believes in him is not condemned. But he who is, did not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Amen. Amen. Out of love, out of Jesus' own testimony of love in John chapter 10, verse 17, he said, I lay down my life. No one takes it from me. He said, I have the power to lay down my life. I have the power to take it back again. And as a result of God's love, he has delivered us from the power of darkness. He's translated us into the kingdom of his dear son the only one in whom we have redemption. Because of God's love, 
we having been dead in our sins and our uncircumcision of our flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven all trespasses, paid in full, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. He took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So we see because of the love of God, God has already given the best he could give. He gave Christ. And he will not withhold things we need. And I want to make this real clear. We have to stick to the context. Remember the context is talking about making it to heaven. And now God has guaranteed our salvation for those who believe in Jesus Christ, those who know him as Lord and Savior. That's the same context here. Context doesn't change. He will not withhold things we need to make it to heaven. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Verse 33 of Romans 8. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? That's a good question. It means who can accuse a believer before God? It is God that justifies. So who can lay anything to the charge of God's people? Well, let me tell you, Satan tries. Revelation 12, 10. It's written that Satan accuses the brethren before God both day and night. He is our accuser. Categoros is the word. It means he is like the prosecuting attorney. But guess what? The defense attorney is Christ. Christ defeated Satan on the cross of Calvary. And there's not one charge that can be leveled against a Christian that Satan makes before God that can stand. He can't lay anything to the charge of God's elect. As it's written here, because it's God who justifies sinners by the blood of Christ, and God is omnipotent. All-powerful, more powerful than anyone or anything else. And I want us to see also that it's our great high priest. Jesus is our defense attorney who intercedes on our behalf. Verse 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Tells us here that Christ died for the defendant. No one can condemn believers because Christ died for the defendant. He rose from the dead. He's now at the right hand of God, interceding on behalf of the defendant. Praise the Lord. It's through Christ that we are assured that we'll make it to heaven if we're truly born again. The love of God. Hebrews 7, 25, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 and 6, There is one God, 
and only one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Jesus is our great high priest, intercedes on our behalf. He's our sympathetic high priest. Hebrews 4, verse 14 and 16. Seeing that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In verse 35, Paul brings up another question. He says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Well, the answer obviously is nothing. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Well, the love of Christ is revealed in the gift of salvation by grace through faith. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Not the pressures of life, not difficult circumstances, not persecution, not shortage of food, lack of clothing, impending danger, or even the threat of death. Because those things for a truly born-again believer those things work to draw us closer to God. They work to draw us closer to God and deepen our faith in God. Philippians 1, 6, the Apostle Paul puts it this way, He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ Jesus. God uses the trials of life to draw believers close to him. You hear people and you hear about people all the time who are deconstructing their faith. Why do they deconstruct their faith? Well, because they in, went through something traumatic. They went through something traumatic in life. And so they deconstruct their faith. God uses the trials of life to draw us closer to him. Amen. Amen. In Isaiah 61, 3, we see that he gives beauty for ashes. The oil of joy for mourning the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. They might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Notice in verse 36 and 37, as it is written, and this is a quotation that Paul gives from Psalm 44, 22, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Paul reminds us that in this life, by quoting this from Psalm 44, 22, that in this life the people of God will face affliction. 
there will be suffering. Suffering might even include martyrdom. There should be nothing strange or unexpected about suffering for the cause of Christ. But instead of separating us from Christ's love, these things draw us closer to him. We're not only conquerors, we're more than conquerors through the love of God. That supernatural love brings sweetness out of bitterness. It brings strength out of weakness. It brings triumph out of tragedy. It brings blessings out of heartbreak. And God's love is our security for all eternity. Enduring love is found in the love that God has for his people. God's love endures for eternity. Verse 38, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wow, that's a mouthful. He has said that death cannot separate us from the love of God because Christ's resurrection guarantees our resurrection to life eternal. He said life cannot separate us from the love of God. The trials of life, the things we go through in this life, the heartbreaks we encounter, the problems we have, life cannot separate us from the love of God. Principalities and powers, very interesting here. Those words are used to refer to fallen angels, demons. The demons of hell cannot separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Neither can angels, supernatural beings, Angels of God cannot separate us from the love of God, nor things present, nor things to come. That means the current circumstances of our life can never separate us from the love of God. Those things that come tomorrow or the next day, somewhere in the future, cannot separate us from the love of God. Nor height, nor depth. You ever been on the mountaintop? Everybody know what the mountaintop I'm referring to is? That mountaintop where all is great and grand and glory and, and you're rejoicing and thankful and happy and joyous and that mountaintop experience that we have now and then in life. Do you know that sometimes being on the mountaintop can cause us to forget about God? Because things are just going so well. Even mountaintop, being on the mountaintop cannot separate us from the love of God. And the depths. You ever been in the valley? The valley of depression? The valley of anxiety? Worry? Fear? Doubt? For the born again believer, neither height nor depth, neither extremity can separate us from the love of God. 
Matter of fact, there's nothing in creation that can separate us from the love of God. Because rather these things bring us in conformity to the image of Christ. They all work together for our good. They serve to draw us closer to God. As we prepare to close, in Matthew 7, verse 24 through 27, Jesus tells of two men. Both of these men were building houses. One built his house upon the rock. And the storm came, the winds blew and beat on that house. And the house that was built upon the rock stood, withstood the storm. The other man built his house upon the sand. No foundation in Christ. Christ is that rock. The other man built his house on the sand and the wind blew and the storm came and that house fell. And great was its fall. Such is the enduring love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He's the rock that never fails. Amen. His love is enduring love. Enduring love that sees believers to heaven. With every eye closed, every head bowed. This enduring love is God's love. It's given only to those who trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior. Are you living this day in the power of God's love? Are you living this day in the assurance of salvation that was bought by the blood of Christ? God's love is enduring. Guaranteed to take us to heaven. This very day, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? He's the one who is our only propitiation for sin. Father in heaven, during this time, I do pray for the spirit of conviction to be upon, upon everyone gathered here this day. Lord, to examine their life and answer these questions. And Father, if there are any here this day who are not born again, that this would be the day of their salvation. In Christ's name we humbly pray. Amen.